Welcome, and thank you for joining the National Housing Conference for today's webinar sponsored by NeighborWorks America. This is the third webinar in our NeighborWorks series. It's been a pleasure working with our long-standing member and stakeholder. I want to particularly acknowledge NeighborWorks CEO, Marietta Rodriguez, and Kirsten Johnson Obi, a member of NHC's Board of Governors. NHC values collaboration as a driving force for us and our members, and we're proud to offer programs like these to help shape the conversation around housing policy. Today, we'll be hearing from experts to discuss adaptive reuse. As we continue to look forward to the new normal in a post-pandemic landscape, we know that our cities and neighborhoods are likely to change to an extent and in ways we cannot predict. The pandemic caused a shift in how and where we live and work. Offices were closed. Employees worked from homes in unprecedented numbers, often overnight. Many will continue to work from home, predominantly or permanently, after the pandemic is over. These changes have left us with empty buildings and unused spaces. We all know by now that there are serious housing supply deficits across the nation, millions of units. Even before the pandemic, we were seeing the loss of usable space as areas suffered from disinvestment. Adaptive reuse offers a way for housing developers to utilize existing structures that are otherwise decommissioned in order to build new housing and develop communities. As a native Detroiter, I've witnessed this firsthand in the Central Business District, where dozens of former office and industrial spaces, long abandoned, have been converted to residential and mixed use. The benefits of adaptive reuse are twofold. It develops much needed housing while utilizing vacant space that otherwise does not serve the community. Today's panel will offer insight on how to successfully pursue adaptive reuse projects, how to make them financially feasible, and what redevelopment of spaces can mean for shifting populations. Our discussion today is moderated by Mike Kinsella, CEO of Up for Growth. There'll be a Q&A discussion later during the presentation. So please submit questions through the Q&A feature for consideration by the panel. And we're gonna open the program with a presentation by David Garcia, Policy Director at the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome, David. Thank you very much for the introduction, David. Happy to be here uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. So just a bit of background on the Turner Center and what we do. So uh, the Turner Center is a housing research and policy organization at UC Berkeley. We focus on really all manners of housing from the cost of construction to land use reform uh, to program evaluations as well. Um, but today we're here to talk about our recent work on the conversion of commercial property into residential. And it's, it's something we've actually uh, done a lot of work on over the past year. Uh, and so before I jump into some of our uh, results from this research, I wanted to do just a bit of context setting. Um, so really, it, it's, it's important to understand why this is, uh, is necessary to, to examine. David alluded to some of these uh, trends in his earlier comments, but just to reiterate, you know, um, the pandemic has presented us with a lot of changes in the way that we live our day-to-day -day lives. And in some cases, these changes are presenting us with new opportunities to create housing in a way uh, that is uh, that could be beneficial for affordable housing, market rate housing, and also align, aligning with um, important economic development and climate change mitigation goals. Um, but specifically, these opportunities have to do with um, uh, a accelerated shift to e-commerce. This was something we experienced or observed before the pandemic and, and was definitely uh, exacerbated um, during the last two years. Uh, and so as a result, we have a lot of retail centers, strip malls, things like that, that are at this point uh, underutilized and may never return to their former kind of, uh, full occupancy as brick and mortar um, uh, places. And so it gives us an opportunity to reposition these as, as housing. 
Similarly, uh, working from home looks to be uh, a permanent trend. So uh, we, do, we do not have the need for as much office space or office footprints uh, like we did before. And so are there opportunities to convert some of these spaces into housing as well? And, and uh, it's important to look at specifically adaptive reuse because uh, again, it is almost always an infill type of project, right? It's generally going to be close to jobs, close to amenities and parks and schools, more so than, than outward growth uh, would provide. Um, and so adaptive reuse can really provide us not just with an opportunity to create housing, but an opportunity to create housing in a way that aligns with many of our other policy goals. And so that's why uh, we've been particularly interested in this topic. And over the past um, 18 months, we've had a series of papers on this general topic from understanding the characteristics of where this land is located, are they in high opportunity areas, are they in walkable communities, things like that but also the likelihood that underutilized retail and office parcels will actually be converted. This is something we've examined in California where we've taken past trends of conversions uh, and, and predicted them forward to see what uh, percentage can we expect uh, of our housing goals to be met by this type of development. Um, but we're gonna focus specifically on the potential of adaptive reuse. So um, existing office buildings, retail, things like that, and seeing them turned into new homes. Um, so I'm going to walk through some of the results of this research. Um, and basically, this research was done in consultation with practitioners who are actively pursuing these projects or have done them, done them in the past. And uh, you can, I'll drop a link in the chat to this work as well if you're interested in seeing the paper. Um, so to start, we looked at the architectural features, right? Like what, uh, what are the characteristics of the buildings themselves that lend themselves to uh, successful adaptive reuse projects? I think there's a, um, um, an idea that we can basically turn any building into housing. And I think with enough money, that's true. But actually, there actually are a series of, um, of characteristics that really lend themselves to adaptive reuse that we were trying to focus in on with this work. And so things like shallow floor plates are, are really important for light and air requirements. Uh, many times office buildings have really deep floor plates, which means that we have to uh, cut through the center of the buildings to create light wells or atriums, um, and which will oftentimes trigger the relocation of, of mechanical systems and whatnot, and that, that gets really expensive. Um, we also noted that a lot of times in buildings that were uh, built before 1980, there's a lot of remediation that has to happen, right? Asbestos, lead paint, um, and you don't always know the extent of that until you actually open the walls and dig into the building itself. Um, we also noted that there are a lot of systems uh, that need to be replaced in older buildings that oftentimes um, cost just as much as it would in a new construction project, sometimes more. Right, so these are really significant barriers to conversion when we're looking at older buildings. Um, also, the last thing I'll note on this slide is that you know uh, there, there needs to be a large enough building footprint in order for make a pro in order to make a project really work. Right, so we found that the sweet spot was around uh, 50 units uh, to to fit into an existing building in order for that uh, that project to, to work uh, successfully on the market. We also found that land use and code flexibility are really important to making these projects work, right? So we observed a number of cities that had specific ordinances that helped to facilitate uh, successful adaptive reuse by loosening code requirements or things like parking, right? So in areas where um, you're uh, held to the same standards as say a new residential construction, um, we know that uh, that's very the unique type of product uh, adaptive reuse is, and a lot of times our existing code requirements are not situated well to uh, to really work for adaptive reuse. So things like parking requirements uh, might not work, particularly in an urban setting where you don't have a surface parking lot next door, and it would be really expensive to to dig under the building and create a parking garage that way. So to the extent that localities can um, uh, create some flexibility in their codes or create specific ordinances for adaptive reuse, that really makes these projects worthwhile. Another thing we noted is that um, by leveraging the fact that there is an existing building in the community, that can uh, really help 
uh, with opposition to new projects. As we know, in certain places, there is significant opposition to the creation of new housing. Um, but with adaptive reuse, oftentimes you can get community uh, support uh, for the reuse of the building that maybe was sitting vacant before. So that was another key component that, that we observed in our research. And the last thing I'll note is that there are several economic factors to weigh when considering an adaptive reuse project. In many cases, there is underutilized space in the building. Think, uh, think parking spaces or old boiler rooms or mechanical rooms that needed to be very large when the building was originally constructed, but maybe today could also be leveraged for um, additional residential space and can help the project pencil better. Um, there are other issues though that can work against a project. So for example, um, you may have an existing building that is underzoned, right? So it may be more financially advantageous to tear the building down and build much higher if the zoning allows for that. Um, we also just know that there's general uncertainty around what the construction costs are going to be. Again, it's really hard to predict what you're going to run into in an older building. You don't know what's um, what's really there until you start opening up the floors and the walls. And a lot of times uh, there is uh, a lot of uncertainty and that can eat up into your contingency and make the project uh, more expensive than you had originally realized. So through this work, we had a couple recommendations. They're, they're very general, but I think they're important. And the first is again, you know, local ordinances are so important to making these projects work. They can be tailored to what that specific community is looking for and can help create more flexibility to meet building code requirements or other things um, that otherwise might be uh, somewhat onerous for an adaptive use project uh, to, to meet and be successful. Um, the last thing we note is that you know, funding to support adaptive use projects is oftentimes uh, really key, right? So things like the historic tax credits, um, there is a bill um, by uh, Senator Stabenow that would allow for, um, for tax credits uh, to be used for adaptive reuse as well in, in downtown areas. In the state of California, the governor has proposed some money in the budget that would help facilitate adaptive reuse there as well. So there are definitely, from policy perspective, things we can do to make these projects work better. Um, and again, uh, really, this is going to be really important for us as we look to um, a kind of a new reality where retail and, and commercial development um, or existing uh, structures are just not uh, utilized as much as, as they uh, would have been in the past. And so um, really important to think creatively about how to get these projects to work um, and how to get them to work within the existing framework of our uh, land use regulations, right? Um, so I'm going to stop there. Again, I'll share uh, a link in the chat to this work. And again, we have a whole series on this topic that we're, we're happy to, to share with everyone here. Um, but now I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, someone who has a real on the ground experience with building these things. Let me just talk through the kind of theoretical qualitative work, um, but I'm happy to introduce Amy Kashani, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the work she's done on the ground. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present our work and I look forward to the rest of this conversation. Um, Amy, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Amy Kashani. I'm a Senior Vice President of Real Estate Development with Pastone Corporation. We are a regional nonprofit in upstate New York. Um, the project I'm showing is, um, is um, Skyview Park Apartments. And Skyview Park Apartments, coincidentally, we did the ribbon cutting yesterday. Um, this is a senior, affordable senior development within the um, blighted, vacant Arundacoit Mall in um, upstate New York, um, upstate New York. It is, um, it, it is a partnership with um, our local hospital, Rochester Regional Health, to provide uh, services for frail elderly. I'll talk a little, what I'm gonna talk, discuss a little bit is a little bit of the history of the town of Arundacoit because when we decide to do something, especially in adaptive reuse, we need to have a market and we need to understand our market. So the town of Arundaquite was founded in 1839. It was one of the first suburbs of the city of Rochester, Metro Rochester. And in the early 50s and 60s, a lot of the people that moved in there were young families 
basically because they wanted to get away from the city, but they needed to be relatively close and they were raising their, their children. So they wanted to, there was the beginning of sprawl, I guess. By the seventies, the residents, most of the residents that were there, 70% of them were still the residents that moved in in the fifties, but their children had moved on, but they stayed there because their friends were there, their roots were there. And, um, and so um, we, had, we had a population, we had, we had an elderly population or primarily elderly pop population in the town of Brundacoit already. We also had services because as people aged, the services started coming. We had um, elder care providers, we had hospital health facilities, a local hospital, uh, the doctor's offices, restaurants, shopping, transit. It was, it was on a bus line, it was close because it was the first suburb, it was close to the city of Rochester and yet it, it had access to all the other suburbs. So it was pretty um, centrally located. So then we go to the Arundelquoit Mall, which was um, in, located in the um, town of Arundelquoit, in the primary artery of the town of Arundelquoit. It was constructed in 1990, and it was one of the largest malls, two-story indoor malls in upstate New York at the time. It, it, was, um, it was approximately, it housed approximately 10 acres of land and could house up to 110 stores. It was easy access to downtown. It was by the expressway. It was right off the artery. And, and when it opened, because we had young family, families there and elderly, we had, it catered to the families and it catered to the seniors. It had, because it was enclosed, it had wonderful walking space. So the seniors could get their um, exercise. It had restaurants, it had shops, it, People would go there just to visit with their friends, and it was a it was the place to go in the for the area. And the map shows exactly the proximity. It was called Arundelquoit Mall, and then it was called Medley Center. And you could see you could see all of the um, the shops and all and Wegmans, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the the uh, retail stores, and. It, banks and hospital and senior community. So this is what the mall looked like in, in the beginning, in the 1990s, in its heyday. It was huge. It was, a, it was really a benefit to the community it was located in. It had a carousel. It had, when all the stores occupied the mall, it was a beautiful place to go for people. Uh, but in the 1990s, we, we built, it was built in early 1990s. By late 1990s, large chains began to merge and that there wasn't such a need for large retail space. So the mall was, um, so the mall started losing tenants. And then to add to that, the mall was, because of its proximity to the ci a city, there was um, so a rumor that there was, um, that there was a um, danger in the area, there was crime. It was never substantiated, but the word got out and it affected the, um, the, the uh, people coming to the mall. So more stores started vacating. And by 2016, the last anchor store Sears shut down and the mall was totally vacant from 2016 um, and it, you know, it, it, it's a big, it covers a big space, so it was a big impact on the community. Pathstone um, was interested in redevelopment, in, in developing additional housing for seniors in Arundequoit because we knew that there was a market. We already had a senior development in Arundequoit and we had a huge waiting list. So we, we knew that the consolidated plan indicated a need we knew that the seniors that were there didn't want to leave. And we couldn't, if the seniors don't leave their housing as they age, it'll be more difficult for them and you're not making room for the, um, the younger uh, families. So um, we looked at the, the resources and we knew that there were services. There were definitely services for seniors. So it was an ideal place to, um, 
to develop and to continue to develop senior housing. However, because it was one of the first suburbs, um, there was a lack of uh, suitable vacant land um, for the construction of, of new development that would be in an ideal location, easily accessible to everything. So then we looked at other options for development and adaptive reuse was an opportunity that we wanted to explore. And what better place to do it in, um, in the mall, within the mall, because there was sufficient space that we could creatively develop and house and accommodate senior living. We could, um, we could meet the housing need and the ability for seniors to really age in place. We, we had enough flexibility that we could allow them to age in place and we can turn a community eyesore, which has been a, a real eyesore for that community into a thriving economic asset and hopefully become a catalyst for future economic development within the mall. So as a result of that, we developed 157 units total. For us, the economy of scale was 157 units. But we did take the Sears building, the Sears box store, and that was the one that we decided to develop. Because it was an adaptive reuse, there was no way we were gonna get 157 units in that building. So what we did was we, we worked on the, the Sears adaptive reuse and we were able to um, maximize the unit size to 73 units, but we needed more. So what we added an adjacent new construction building to house the balance of the units, the, the 84 units, and we connected them via a skywalk so that no one felt that they were not part of the whole thing. And from the Sears building, we kept the opening to the mall so that the seniors could continue to walk the mall and hopefully um, enjoy all the benefits of the mall as the mall was filling up. We also wanted to serve, we want, our, our goal was to provide um, a, a project where people could really truly age in place. So what we did then was we partnered with the local hospital, um, Rochester Regional Health, and we, um, they were our supportive services part, partner and um, they're providing services for frail elderly. And in New, York, in New York State, New York State offers a program um, uh, in New York State to, for supportive housing initiative where Rochester Regional Health gets funded for, um, for providing services. So it's a win-win for everyone. What I've highlighted here is my, um, my budget and how we were able to close the gap and fund the project. It was a little bit of everything. We, we uh, went to the county and we got a little bit of money. We went to the town and because they had suffered so much, they agreed to give us money. They also agreed to give us a pilot. We got money for funding from, um, from ESHI, which was the, a supportive housing program. We, um, we were, were able to receive some incentives for energy efficiency and, um, and we got tax credits. We got the, we went in as a four percent as of right bond project, and we got tax credits. We sold our tax credits, and that was the equity. And we also, um, because we believed in the project, we also loaned money back into the project. So, what's happening since our project was developed? Uh, well, a, um. The, the town actually put in their community center. And because of the, not only the senior population in our project, but because of the large senior population in the community, one floor is dedicated on the community center only to the seniors. And, um, and the local hospital put in their school of nursing program, which is um, at another anchor store, which is, great for our project and, um, and the local senior community, um, community uh, center 
put in a daycare, a senior daycare center in the project. So things are starting to move in the direction it needs to be move, moved in. And this is what it looks like. I mean, these are renderings, but this is what it looks like. It can look like right now and, and what it is starting to look like. This is the project. What we had to do in order to meet uh, universal building codes is we had to raise the roof. And that is the result of raising the roof so we could meet um, light and, um, and, and um, ventilation, natural light and ventilation means. And across there is the bridge connecting the new with the old. That's another picture of the bridge while the project was in construction. And this is our final product. And um, we were lucky that um, NeighborWorks was, um, helped us to analyze the project because as Mike said, that there's, um, you really have to do a feasibility analysis and, and, and you have to do it in depth for an adaptive reuse. It's not a simple feasibility analysis. And we were very lucky that NeighborWorks was able to um, assist us with pre-development funding to, um, to accomplish that. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And and as I see, some of the uh, participants are, are noting on the on the group chat, a uh, very inspiring story. Very amazing to see uh, new life brought to a, a Sears in a in a mall that has ended its useful life as a, a shopping center, but but clearly has uh, a new life ahead of it. So um, thank you for sharing this case study uh, with you. us. Um, and, and hi, everyone. My name is Mike Kingsella. I, I'm the, the CEO of Up for Growth. Uh, we are, uh, as I see um, many familiar uh, names on the attendee le uh, list, um, as, as many of you know, uh, we are a national cross-sector member network uh, that is laser focused on solving America's housing shortage um, and affordability crisis through data-driven research and evidence-based policy. And I, I just have to say, um, really, appreciative of the National Housing Conference uh, for convening uh, today's discussion on adaptive reuse in a post-pandemic uh, environment. Um, this is clearly uh, a strategy uh, and an opportunity uh, for America to chip away uh, at a shortage of homes um, in the millions. And uh, we're just very appreciative of the leadership of the conference, um, of the Turner Center. David, appreciate your remarks earlier. And I'm really excited uh, to this dynamic conversation that we're gonna have with three experts. Um, and so I'm just gonna dive into it. I'd like to ask Amy, Antoine, and Abigail to, uh, to go ahead and turn on your cameras. Um, and you know, I think today we're interested in having a, a really interactive and engaging dialogue uh, on this issue. Uh, exploring challenges, exploring opportunities, exploring opportunities through public policy uh, to really get more homes built um, through uh, the reuse uh, and conversion of underutilized assets like we heard about uh, from Amy. So I'm going to jump into um, uh, uh, initial questions and intros. I'm going to ask each speaker, uh, just provide a brief in introduction to yourself as you, uh, as you jump in here. But Antoine, um, you know, you hail uh, from Detroit, obviously have an experience in both architecture um, and also uh, 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 working in public policy in your role at the city of Detroit. Um, so could you share with us uh, sort of what the landscape looks like in your town? Uh, what are your experiences in uh, community and economic development in Detroit? And what role uh, does adaptive reuse play in terms of addressing housing needs for your community? Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank NLC for the uh, opportunity. Uh, I serve as a director of planning and development for the city of Detroit. I've uh, been here for just short of a year. Uh, after doing a number of planning and design activities, as well as community development in the city of Houston. Uh, the city of Detroit uh, offers a phenomenal opportunity for adaptive reuse. Many people are aware uh, that we have uh, excellent large scale uh, and smaller scale uh, buildings that some of them have been vacant for uh, several decades. 
uh, but they have presented us the opportunity uh, to revisit and re-deliver um, uh, units for housing, affordable housing, senior housing, as well as for commercial activities. And we're in the midst of delivering those uh, even as we speak. So one of the things I'm going to encourage everyone uh, is to, if you have not been to Detroit in a couple of years, you might want to come back. You will not uh, recognize it. And if you've never been to Detroit, this is one of the most exciting cities in this country right now. And we've got projects across the landscape uh, that are going to be attractive for Detroiters and for those that want to return. That's great. Thanks, Antoine. And um, I've, I've had the opportunity to visit Detroit um, uh, in, in 2009 uh, and again in 2016. And uh, the, the change just over that seven year period uh, was remarkable. In fact, I know that uh, adaptive reuse of buildings are one thing, but the adaptive reuse of public places are another. And, and the investments in transportation and specifically your streetcar system um, in, in the plaza there in the center of the city um, is quite remarkable. And, and on that note, I'd like to turn over to Abigail uh, with the National League of Cities. And Abigail, you've done a lot of work, not only of thinking about uh, housing and adaptive reuse, but really adaptive reuse and repositioning and leverage of great public places. So um, Abigail, um, one question for you is how are your member cities thinking about uh, community assets like jobs, transit, other amenities um, as it uh, builds out its policies and really thinks about um, leveraging existing buildings for, let's say, more housing production. Could you talk a bit about that intersection um, uh, for us all? Oh, thanks, Mike, and happy to be here. Hello to everyone. Uh, yes, like I said, my name is Abigail Mangar. I'm a Health and Resilience Program Manager at NLC, and we mostly are a member organization of thinking about those smaller town, smaller medium cities, as well as some rural towns to offer them guidance and technical support on addressing issues such as housing and economic development. And so when we think about um, these ideas of adapting reuse of public spaces, you see the process of how you would approach thinking about adaptive reuse of reconsidering the function of a place is really similar to what we saw at the start of the pandemic of people starting to reimagine what public space can look like. So we're taking a shift to know that these kind of static forms of how we've looked at our roads, our streets, our buildings, what's inside buildings can actually be more flexible if we give it a chance with our policies. And I think the concept for our members, it's still a relatively for some forward thinking, but I think some, it can be very daunting. So I think there has to be a lot of care and consideration of those local governments where you might have just one government employee who is the housing um, staff member for the whole city. And for them, how do you tell them about this concept of adaptive reuse of let's reconsider the way you've been doing this process for years, maybe even decades. So there is this area of really taking the time to cater to thinking about the process and envisioning and then getting to the development decision-making. Yeah, and, and maybe to both Antoine and Abigail, as you think about placemaking and uh, areas of opportunity, um, you know what, I, I guess, Abigail, for your members, what lens are they really applying in terms of prioritizing and thinking about that connection? Or maybe, Antoine, you could speak to that because I know a big part of the Detroit sto story has been really creating new areas of opportunity through strategic investments in, in the repositioning of both existing public and private spaces. So I'm, I'm just curious if you could comment on sort of how you think about policies um, to support not only more housing, uh, but creating uh, opportunity uh, for folks and for, uh, for communities that maybe in the past haven't been um, in, in receiving the kinds of investment uh, that other places have. That's a couple of things there, Mike. I mean, first of all, we made a concerted effort in 2014 and in 2017, uh, we doubled down uh, to launch something called the Strategic Neighborhood Fund, uh, which was created Essentially, it's a public-private partnership where uh, many of our uh, corporate entities came together and uh, gave funds specifically for the development of infrastructure and for housing uh, and um, um, park areas outside of the downtown core. 
Uh, we started with three areas in 2014. In 2017, we launched uh, seven more areas. And each, I call them areas because each area is a collection of neighborhoods. So it's not just one neighborhood. And uh, the overall, that was a contribution between all 10 of those areas. It's a contribution of $63 million by our corporate sector. And it, we were able to leverage over another $157 million in philanthropic and uh, public support. So overall, we had a 200 plus million inf infusion leading to development in these areas. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, on one of our major corridors in the very first iteration of this on Livernois, which was often called the uh, Avenue of Fashion, it's often referred to as the, the oldest uh, African-American commercial district in the country. And it led to the creation now of 18 uh, new African-American owned small businesses just along this one and a half mile uh, corridor. And uh, it's it's been tremendous to see uh, what this transformation can do to this commercial district and the catalyzing effect it has uh, on our streetscape, on the, the uh, areas and the neighborhoods that immediately abut it, uh, and serve as a model for other parts of the city. And so those are just one model I can speak to. Additionally, I've got several adaptive reuse projects that we can talk to, everything that have led to uh, um, affordable housing, which is a necessity. Uh, for us, whenever a developer comes to do uh, multifamily housing, uh, at a certain threshold, 20% uh, of those units have to be affordable to households of 80% or below. And so that's something that any developer, large or small, has to know coming into the city of Detroit. And we've been able to now add to our affordable housing uh, capacity as a result of that for every new development coming to town. That's terrific. So you're bringing money to the table uh, and you're you're setting up a framework where you're able to ensure that there's lasting affordability created while you get more housing overall. Uh, and I love the, the, the discussion around the mix of uses and really building out complete neighborhoods in, in Abigail. You know, uh, I, I think that um, that intersection with your work uh, is really important for policymakers uh, and, and communities to keep front of mind. I want to turn over to Amy as a practitioner. Amy, um, you know, we really appreciated your case study. And I think uh, David Garcia uh, spoke to this um, in, in his initial presentation. You know, often the conversion of, of uh, buildings uh, that were built for other purposes, like offices or shopping centers, um, are quite expensive, right? And, and it seems like a bit of a Goldilocks where, you know, you have the right for floor plate size, you have the right sort of characteristics. Um, you know, curious how you think about uh, different product types um, within the commercial category, retail, industrial, office, do certain types lend themselves more to redevelopment, repurposing of housing? Are there opportunities to expand um, the uh, 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 suitability uh, for properties for conversion uh, with different tools in the toolbox, just generally understanding what are some of the ways that you are able to make these adaptive reuse projects work? Um, and where do you see opportunities, um, you know, in the broader uh, policy uh, conversation that cities are having? Well, firstly, when we did our, our adaptive reuse and when we do any of very complicated projects, we bring our team in from the beginning. We bring our engineer in, we bring our architect in, we bring our general contractor in. And as a team, we, we carefully, carefully analyze um, the feasibility of the development. We're not gonna get everything, we're not gonna understand everything until we get into the building but we try and do a really good job at um, catching as many things that may be cost, costly items as we can in advance. And where we don't have the funding, we try to do um, work with value engineering. And that's why it's critical that the whole team is part of the analysis. Um, we, um, you know, sometimes, we, uh, because of the condition of the project, we, and it's, a, it's, it's an eyesore for the community, there may be other foundational, foundation grants or other funding through the city so that we can um, correct some of the issues um, and close the gap. It won't be a lot of money, but it might be something and you cobble it all together. Um, the other thing that we looked at 
was um, this was part of a mall and this was part of a blighted mall. So we really took a chance to go into this mall and develop senior housings. And if should the mall not succeed, all those thoughts came across our board and they said, well, what do we do? Should them, if we're in the middle of the mall, should the mall not succeed? So the location of the development is really critical as well, because that way, should the mall not succeed, you can still sustain yourself and, and have access to the outside. And, um, and no matter what the cost was, instead of sharing some of the, um, the utility costs, instead of sharing some of the utility costs, we opted to have our own utility, utility lines going through. So we're independent within the mall. Um, those are ways that we could kind of hedge ourselves and protect ourselves in ways that we could kind of know what our costs are. I don't think you're gonna be able to solve the problems because as David said, if it was built before the eighties and depending on what the use was, you may have environmental issues. Um, and if it was, um, you know, and, and, um, and there may be um, structural issues because if it's blighted and it's, um, it's um, with the weather, you know, with, it's been exposed to the weather, you may have other issues. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like buying an old house. You know, you don't know what's going to be in there when you start opening up the walls to renovate. But the, the best you can do is to, um, to, to bring, bring together a team in advance, a, a, yeah. a qualified team, and analyze everything. Yeah. And Antoine, maybe kicking it back to you, because I know you had mentioned the fund that you, you had, had raised through, through both public and, and private um, uh, public um, uh, uh, financing sources and, and private sector um, uh, philanthropic, it sounds like, investment, right? So the city has a real, and what I know of Detroit is you have a very intentional approach to community revitalization um, and community and economic development. So I'm curious, you know, it sounds like from Amy's perspective, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the challenge is the unknown. What's behind the wall? Uh, when was the building built? Is there or are there not environmental challenges? You know, um, there seems to be quite a bit of variability uh, in rehabilitation cost per foot. If it's an old Sears versus a office building from the 1920s, of course, Detroit has quite a bit of, of diversity in its sort of architectural character and, and overall building stock. How active do you get? Do you have any approaches from a city perspective to mitigate that risk for folks looking to adapt and, and reposition existing buildings? Or how are you thinking about this from a, from a city's perspective? We're uh, pretty active with our developer community. Uh, as you as you noted, we have a significant amount and a variety of uh, abandoned facilities, but we are taking them approach. We have a residential approach, and we also have what we're calling an industrial approach. Uh, we're not turning our back on our industrial nature and, and history of the city, but rather uh, uh, embracing it and using it as a as a, a real asset uh, to the city. Right? One that we had an announcement maybe two weeks ago, uh, the Fisher Body Plant, which had been uh, you know, vacant for about 25 years and was the home uh, for making essentially the bodies of Chevys and, and, a, and a couple of other entities. Uh, now it's gonna turn into a 400 plus unit uh, residential facility. Uh, it's a $134 million project. It's the largest African-American led project in the city of Detroit's history. And we're really excited about that, but it was a collaborative uh, effort by that developer team uh, but we also provided uh, support in uh, CDBG grants, I mean, uh, uh, funding. Uh, there's some LIHTC funding in there, there's some historic tax credits. So we're working with the developer community to not only uh, take blighted, uh, um, you know, facilities off the rolls, if you will, but also to help them, uh, you know, accumulate the capital stack. Right, you know, a good developer, they're going to come with some resources and for things that make a lot of sense and will add, uh, you know, to the community and to the neighborhood, we want to ensure that we're able to be a good partner. Now, the last thing I also want to do with that, and I think it's in integral to mention, the city of Detroit is the largest city in the nation that actually has a community benefits ordinance 
And so for any project that we do, as, but including adaptive reuse, that has $75 million or more in the cost and at least a million dollars in uh, public support, uh, they are required to have a community led uh, council be a part of that development team. And so that's something that shows that not only are we committed to doing a uh, great adaptive reuse in the city, but that it will be uh, led and partnered by the residents that we're serving. So we're really excited about that opportunity. That's terrific. That's a terrific story and, and a great model. And I wish we had more time for a case study on that Fisher body plant. So uh, maybe a future NHC webinar. Um, Abigail, would love to go over to you. I mean, I want to put this all in perspective and, and just sort of ground ourselves again and, you know, the why uh, behind uh, this conversation of commercial to residential. I mean, I big, think a big part of uh, the challenge um, municipal leaders um, uh, like Antoine are uh, driving at is, you know, our nation has fallen into, is experiencing an affordability crisis uh, that is at unprecedented levels, at least in the last 50 years. Uh, we have the shortage of homes. Um, that means that we're, we have a, a, a significantly increasing number of Americans um, experiencing cost burdening, uh, home ownership, you know, entry level homes, starter homes are, are virtually off the table um, in a lot of places around the country, no matter you're talking about Detroit or uh, Berkeley, California or, or, or places in New York. And so I'm curious, um, you know, as you think about your membership and, you know, we're talking about, you know, suburban uh, New York, we're talking about downtown Detroit. You know, I'm curious as you think about, let's say, more middle market, uh, uh, exurban, or even rural communities, um, are you seeing these opportunities, adaptive reuse, um, revitalization, um, coming more to the fore as a strategy to address uh, affordability? I think a lot of our members are really open to wanting to see what they can do based on NLC having expertise in people with housing, people with community development, and also folks on the legislative side. We have a federal advocacy team who's focused on like, let's hear from members, understand your ideas of what problems are happening so we can give information to Congress of we really need these bills. So I think the idea of members being open to hearing about how do we solve these problems. Yeah. I think for them, it's more so we understand this problem is existing and we've heard some ideas of solutions, but we need a lot. We need case examples of hearing from people who are just like us, other local governments. Tell me how they financed it. Tell me what policies or tax credits that they needed to have in place to make it happen. Um, tell me the stakeholders who were involved in the process. What did the timeline look like? So we have an idea of how to do it. So I think for them, the biggest barrier is first, like making sure you have an awareness of sharing those ideas like adaptive reuse with them, but then offering them guidance on who are people who are just of a similar geographic area as us, similar of a size government as us, of staff availability to go and address these problems. That's their biggest desire that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. So a road, so, so not just financial resources, but really a roadmap, best practices, case studies to potentially follow. And then, and then those qualified, you know, professionals that capacity um, to, to realize these, these new strategies. Um, exactly. to, to chip away. Um, yeah, and you know, I want to stick with you for a minute. Um, and I'm actually going to pick on David Garcia's home state since he left the call early, but he probably wouldn't mind me picking on him a little bit. Um, California is the worst in the country uh, when it comes to, you know, not meeting housing needs. Um, you know, we released research at, at Up for Growth back in 2018 that looked at elasticity of housing demand, uh, meeting housing demand, right? And we found that California uh, was the place that had sort of that worse elasticity, meaning for every 1% increase in housing need in the state of California, the market responded with a 0.47% increase in supply. So systematically digging itself into a deficit, which we estimated to be in the millions of homes, just in that state alone. Um, a big part of that, and I, I know all three of you um, uh, understand this dynamic is, um, you know, uh, let's call them neighborhood defenders or preserve 
observers of the status quo, sometimes referred to as NIMBYs. Um, you know, do you think, I, I'm just, and maybe this is a question not just for Abigail, but for, for the entire panel. Um, do you think one potential benefit of adaptive reuse is potentially circumventing uh, NIMBYism or opposition to new housing? In other words, Amy, you know, did you run into less resistance on repurposing a Sears um, for, for senior affordable housing than if you were building strictly ground up? Uh, Antoine, curious, you know, obviously very different dynamics in Detroit than Berkeley, but, you know, curious if you have any opportunities to compare, contrast, um, you know, approval processes and some of the more discretionary um, processes with neighborhood groups in adaptive reuse versus ground up. Just curious to hear if, you know, this panel of experts feels that, you know, adaptive reuse might be a, a key to unlocking um, you know, housing supply by by circumventing some of that neighborhood opposition um, to, to new production? Well, I can speak from my perspective only. Um, um, the town of Arundaquite, the Sears Adaptive Reuse was a lot easier than a new construction product that was trying to go into the town. So yes, that's the case for Arundaquite. However, we tried to do something quite a little similar in a different community in Pennsylvania. Hmm. And we did it, the opposition was terrible. The NIMBYism was terrible. So all I can really say is it depends on the exact product and it depends on the community you're working in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so maybe it's not a silver bullet. Antoine, uh, you know, any perspectives uh, from, from, from your years, both both at the city and before uh, before uh, being at the city? What I found is that NIMBYs exist everywhere, uh, yeah. no matter what the project is, uh, and no matter what even the, the community benefits may, may be. Um, what we've uh, been having some success with in, in Detroit is uh, effective and consistent uh, community engagement and right, and so when we involve our residents uh, long term and uh, consistently, uh, they're beginning to believe that the city actually uh, has their desires and their needs at heart. Uh, and so, you know, I've been preaching to our team early and often, right? So you're going to community meetings, even when there's not a project right on the boards, right? You're going to show that we want to hear um, from our residents. Now, what I found. And I think this should come as no surprise to either Abigail or Amy. There's always one, two, three, four kind of frequent flyers that go to every public meeting and go to every council meeting. And yes. no matter what we do, we're terrible. We're terrible people and we're down. We're there to try to ruin the lives of the community. Uh, fortunately, our elected officials kind of know who those people are, right? And we're able to sift through the noise. But uh, one of the challenges with new development, whether it's new construction or adaptive reuse, we're quote unquote bringing more people. Uh, to an area. And uh, usually it's been the minority. Uh, people really appreciate that we're reactivating um, existing uh, facilities and actually uh, um, really, really do like the fact that we're uh, re-inhabiting these entities that have a cultural resonance uh, with many of the neighbors. And so they're really excited about the projects we have coming to bear. And, and Abigail, I'll, I'll you know kind of want to reframe for you because your focus really on on public spaces. Um, you know what what's your sense of the value of investing in that public realm, and what role can it play uh, in garnering support uh, from a community uh, for more housing um, as part of broader revitalization efforts? Well, I think um, one of the big ideas that people not might not even realize is that they're for it, but they don't even see it. There is these misconceptions of their single family houses. And then there's this mysterious other that we've been like fear mongered about of multifamily housing. And they don't realize these places that are mixed use development that have commercial mixed with residential, um, the work play um, live areas are missing middle housing. So um, we did, when we think about the values of what people learn from the pandemic of the outdoor dining, kind of reusing public spaces, um, being able to walk to services they want, the 15 minute city, these are values that connect to what missing middle housing and adaptive reuse can bring more of. So I think it has a lot to do with first, um, kind of like demystifying a little bit. And obviously we know there's some NIMBY people who, as Anton said, of like, it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> 
but um I think there is an awareness of like a townhouse is missing middle housing a like cottage court area is missing middle housing this adaptive reuse is part of missing middle housing um what if it would to get implemented and it means like I'm closer to a market I'm going to more contribute to these businesses that are near me if I'm in this kind of downtown area so I think the values of reimagining public spaces um offers those ideals of what we're thinking about with adaptive reuse. And so the process is how we're thinking about, let's talk to the community, engage with them to understand what are the values of what you care about in this space that you want to see here. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel like my culture feels seen and valued in this place. Okay, so let's um, think of I don't want to do an hour commute somewhere. I want to be able to live where I work. That's going to make me more healthy. I um, want to see murals in a place or some like installations that reflect my culture and being able to have that in the area I live as well as where I work. Um, kind of like cohesively putting human values with housing, with adaptive reuse. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a terrific, and that makes me think of you know it's almost a blank slate. We almost get to reimagine uh, community, and, and in that process, perhaps uh, if 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 done well, uh, build some more community support that you might not get if it's that you know kind of uh, let's say other uh, that's hard to hard to picture. At least with an existing building, uh, you know, being adapted to a new use, you can see what it is, and it's and it's not you know um, you know a big scary uh, unknown. Known. Um, that's very um, that's very insightful. Thank you, uh, Abigail. I know we're getting close to the the public, um, you know, uh, open uh, Q and A portion uh, of the program, and I gotta say, I'm a little overwhelmed by the number of questions uh, in the chat box. So, Brittany, um, you know, please help me prioritize. But I'm gonna do a lightning round uh, with the three panelists right now. Um, I guess this is maybe the final question before we open it up, uh, which is. If the federal government could do one thing um, to catalyze more um, adaptive reuse, more housing uh, being built out of these older, um, you know, uh, let's say underutilized um, uh, properties, uh, what would that be? Um, and and uh, uh, Amy, since you're a developer, I will start with you. Well, since I'm a developer, more funding so that we can um, close gaps quicker and we can produce more. Great. Uh, Abigail, any any thoughts from a federal perspective? So in last summer, the White House did release in July this fact sheet that talked about actions to rebuild black wealth and narrow the racial wealth gap. And it specifically actually called out adaptive reuse um, through this community revitalization fund of saying like to reuse vacant buildings and storefronts. And it thought of it more of an economic perspective, but I think it's also thinking about it in this narrative of housing as well. We know President Biden has said things about like, let's get people back in the office. But I think of it's interesting to me, we have this language of um, saying the pandemic showcased the housing crisis, as well as so many people are working from home and we're not seeing like, hmm, there's a lot of empty spaces and there's also <laughs> a lot of people who are not downtown. Let's put this together. So I think of reinforcing that there's opportunity here and also the community revitalization fund um, that had already been brought up by the administration. Great, great. That's a great call out. Uh, Antoine? Gail and Amy uh, gave some great examples. And so I will I will uh, agree with both of them and throw a bit of a curveball. Uh, one thing we're looking at here in Detroit, and I think it addresses one of the questions I saw in the uh, Q&A, is a uh, revisiting of the affordability index. Um, as many people know, we, uh, we uh, describe affordability uh, by AMI, and that's how, you know, the threshold is 80%, and if we deliver households at 80% or below, then we are delivering affordability. Well, the, um, the household AMI in the city of Detroit is roughly half than it is for the state of Michigan, right? And so um, when we're able to deliver homes and uh, units at 80% of AMI, they still may not be affordable to households that need it. And yeah. so we're really trying to find uh, out of the box thinking to address that um, so we can move forward. 
Yeah, yeah, and and this sort of is is a, a smaller area, right, um, than the than the broader metro or, or state AMI uh, definition. Yeah, that's a key. That's a key point. Um, all right. Well, on to uh, the open Q and A, and and we've, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've got a lot to get through. Um, so one question um, from from my friend uh, Matthew Haas. Hey, Matthew. Um, isn't the conceptual approach to convert strip malls or office to residential? Um, how populations identify with space usage, common amenities provided to certain types of populations, individuals versus families versus seniors and outside green space. Um, do denser urban markets, a mixed population residential property with mixed use help more adaptive reuse, but in suburban exurban, this might pose a bit more of a challenge due to the suburban mindset. So I guess the question is, is it easier to do adaptive reuse in urban uh, uh, places or is it possible in suburban places as well? Amy, maybe you have some thoughts on that front. I, 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 I come from the mindset the same. It, the mixed use is um, adaptive reuse using the mixed use comp concept is a, is a better approach. Um, and I also think it really does, from my perspective, it really doesn't matter. It's just, um, you have to find the need for both um, economic need and for the residential need. I'll say also of, for those suburban areas that have that mindset of considering how your population is gonna change in the next 10 to 20 years. The AARP released a study last year that said at least 70% of seniors want to age in place. And so when you think about that growing population who desire to stay in their same communities, are you creating areas where they have the resources they need? They're going to need easy access to healthcare services, to groceries, to transportation, and adaptive reuse allows them to be near those services that are really vital for their health and well-being. Yeah, I feel like I saw a study from, it may have been the National Historic Preservation Office that found that disproportionately these uh, existing historic um, office um, structures are, are located proximate to jobs, transportation, opportunity driving assets when compared to, you know, brand new uh, properties. So I think that that sort of connection is a big part of the story and opportunity for all communities, suburban or urban. Um, I'd I have a, I've got another question um, actually for Amy, but at first I want to hop over uh, uh, maybe to Antoine. Um, which is uh, from a small scale developer, it seems. Affordable housing seems great, uh, but I hear you need to be an established firm with a ton of lawyers to keep things straight. What is the feasibility for folks starting out, uh, e.g. leaving a company to start their own development firm to pull off one of these deals? Would a new developer have a chance? And I wanna go to you, Antoine, because I, I have a sense that you, um, you, you, you make it a point to work with a variety of, of builders. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. I, I saw that question in the chat as well, Mike, and I can tell you, I can't speak for every municipality, but we work with developers at every scale. We have developers that are coming in and doing duplexes. We have developers that are coming in and doing $100 million deals. Quite frankly, most of the developers that come in are coming in at the lower able, at the lower scale, right? And, and, and even with that, I use the term developer very loosely. I mean, typically it is a, a individual or sometimes a couple or sometimes a couple of friends that acquire a building or acquire an abandoned uh, apartment complex that might have four units or six units, and uh, they want to repurpose it, right? And and re and and re redo it. So we get those all the time. I, I'm not sure who the person spoke to. Uh, you know, really the the, um, the the need for attorneys comes in and the complexity of the deal if it's a much more expensive deal. But as far as making a duplex or making a quadplex, if you will. Uh, you'd be surprised how linear that process can be. Now, what I do tell developers, especially new ones, uh, there are tools available uh, and accessible for you if you're this is your first time out. Uh, unfortunately, I got calls literally all over the country. I want to come in to Detroit and do some housing. Well, it's not quite that simple, right? I mean, you know, the myth of that you can buy lots for $2 and be a millionaire yeah. in five months is, is a bit overblown. Uh, there is some due diligence that I suggest for all new developers to follow, uh, but it does not nearly have to be as uh, cost prohibitive, uh, at least in our market, as people may believe. 
and I'm trying not to editorialize, but you know, my personal belief is that as we're you know legalizing all of these new forms of housing through zoning reform legislation, and we're talking about you know this new type of opportunity with adaptive reuse, we have a real opportunity to build capacity um, and and bring more people um, and maybe people who historically haven't been represented in the real estate um, and, and housing development space uh, into the game. So I think there's a real opportunity there. Um, and uh, uh, one group that I would call out for for the questioner is um, the Incremental Development Council, uh, which is really uh, focused on small scale um, development, making a ma making a big push on housing. Um, I'm going to go back to Amy uh, with one of the uh, additional questions for her. Uh, what was the affordability term uh, for the pro for the pro for your project um, in New York? How did you initially reach out to the mall uh, to begin the project? And I think I saw another related question in the chat. Uh, which is, you know, how did you get the owner of the property to say a part of the property uh, and not all of it? So I'll let you take all three of those okay. questions. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I have my roots in that town. I came from that town and as did the, um, the CEO of the construction company that we worked with, as did the, the owner of the architectural firm. So we all came from that town, as did the owner of the mall. So we kind of all knew each other and, um, and we approached, as a team, we approached the owner with our concept. What he did is he directed us to a couple of the anchor buildings. This was not an easy feat and I'm not gonna say it's easy because this is, um, we are a nonprofit and he is a for-profit entity. So his mission is a little different than ours, but, um, but what we did was we structured an ownership, a site control that was not what I typically structure with any of my deals, only because he did not want to give up rights to the whole mall. So we structured um, an acquisition price for the, for the improvements of the mall, for the building, and a ground lease for the ground under the building. And that's how we were able to strike a deal. Um, the affordability term was 50 years. So our ground lease had to go beyond 50 years. And so we have a 99, a 95 year ground lease. So that's how we structured it. And the 50 year term, I know that the LIHTC program will require uh, what, 35 years? And so was it shop or was it another source of capital? Actually, uh, the light term LIHTC was extended to the 50 years I to, see. for an I extended see. period of compliance, but it was all the other funding sources. Um, one question, and maybe for Abigail, uh, what about adaptive reuse of massive adjacent parking lots next to let's say obsolete strip malls, for example, in Sherman Oaks, um, known as Fashion Square. This is a mall in Southern California opened in 1962. Large, massive parking overlay zone that requires a huge rezoning by planning commission. And, and you know, surprise, surprise, uh, it's very difficult to get that through the neighborhood uh, 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 folks. So much wasted space that could be developed for housing and and still parking. How much parking does a strip mall really need? Curious if you have any views on that or any, any member cities that are, are thinking about, um, you know, the next 20 years. I mean, we're talking about post-pandemic, but, you know, uh, electric vehicles and autonomous cars around the corner, I think that has to have some implications for land use as well. So any, any thoughts on this, this question about conversion of parking to housing? Yep. So I, it's a really great, interesting question because, um, we not there's not as much awareness of how we have so much overuse of parking in the United States compared to other countries um, where I believe it's about five percent of land use in the United States is for parking alone excessively so that we don't need so trying to reimagine parking spaces to be other purposes is just as much a part of this equation as thinking about actual structures and thinking we're talking a lot about the home of where you live of housing spaces and then these commercial spaces of kind of work places but there is the idea of the third place of places that bring you joy like place making concepts and so yes there's this opportunity of seeing the those types of parking lots as housing but I think 
part of it might come of doing these like smaller investments of first showing like how do you use parking spaces to show value in other purposes? How do you use maybe like a, a, a smaller lot to show its value in other purposes? And then once you're able to show the flexibility of if we use parking in different ways on a smaller scale, it might be able to show more investment of why it's necessary to think of it from a larger context, such as housing. Um, I think your biggest barrier is thinking about how do we either remove or adjust the parking minimum requirement yeah, that many yeah. cities have across the country. Yeah, and I know that there is a wave of cities that are reassessing uh, parking minimum uh, 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 requirements um, in their ordinances. Mm -hmm. The NLC right now is working on a brief that will discuss like flexible ways of thinking about parking for other purposes. So yeah. I've definitely stay tuned um, this year for that coming out. Well, please let us know uh, when that comes out. Very interested to read that report. Uh, I want to jump over uh, back to Antoine. You know, we have a question, you know, we're talking about parking, but, you know, sort of compliance with accessibility. Um, you know, when we're re repositioning an office building, you know, is it, e is it easy or does it require major changes generally? You know, what are the experience of folks with, you know, the cost to put in kitchens and bathrooms and plumbing and buildings for residential, um, much more intensive use than than office. So, you know, what are you seeing as the biggest road roadblocks, maybe regulatory or um, in terms of some of these more practical um, issues? Some of those uh, the regulatory issues we're working through. Um, I think it really is the practical construction challenges, right? Because uh, as you stated, you know, many of ours uh, are vacant. They've been vacant for, you know, some of them a decade, some of them several decades, right? So. Uh, I think um, we heard in an earlier presentation, you know, uh, some of the practical realities of adaptive reuse versus what some of the challenges may be. Uh, so we're working through some of that. We uh, several of our projects we got in brownfield dollars because of that, um, so we can actually support uh, developers that are trying to do uh, these kinds of investments in these uh, facilities. So that's something we're working through. Um, as far as externally, uh, we've had great success in. Um, you know, the, the parking around the structures as well as just infrastructure development uh, externally to the building. So those are some things that uh, we've not had as many roadblocks. The challenges really do come within the facility itself, uh, especially uh, depending upon some of the age of the building. So uh, we're really successful uh, moving forward with that. Yeah, that's 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 uh, that that's interesting. It sounds like you know this goes back to more more funding potentially to to unlock some of these some of these properties, um, you know. And on that, you know, we we hear about the rising cost of building housing. Um, we have an audience question: What was the cost per square foot, uh, Amy? Let's say at your at your uh, project in New York, what was the cost per square foot compared to? what it would have cost if it was brand new construction plus land acquisition. Were there any savings or are there any sort of, or, or is it a wash when it comes to the economics? Well, for the adaptive reuse, it was, I, I, I don't remember the exact cost per square foot, but compared to our new construction, it was similar. It may have been a little bit higher because of some of the things, the unforeseen things that we had, but, but because we knew just about everything that was there when we did our feasibility analysis, we were okay. We were covered yeah. with our contingency. So, um, so yes, it, 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 it can be higher depending on what you find and what you, um, what you find. But that's the value of having a team. I can't reiterate it enough. Have a team there together, working together from the very beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if I can maybe re restate so I understand your answer, it's not really uh, quote unquote uh, a cheaper deal to build housing mm -hmm, through adaptive reuse. It was really an assessment of where that market need was um, and and that you kind of had a path uh, to deliver housing by leveraging or re repurposing that property. Correct. Correct. Um, and on a related point, we received a question. You mentioned the potential to create several and this was directed to me, um, to create several millions of, of units nationally uh, through this strategy. Uh, is there additional info research on the number of housing units that this could generate, particularly affordable 
uh, to low income families and individuals. Any reactions um, to this question, sort of the potential for you know, a lot more housing through the strategy, any research or any anecdotal uh, points anyone would like to raise? I'll say quickly, um, what we're finding in Detroit is that we have to use uh, our existing stock, uh, especially when it comes to single family or lower density. Uh, but definitely on some of the even even multifamily, uh, the construction costs have, have become so out of whack, especially when you consider, you know, the challenges and just in our real estate market locally in Detroit, um, where we're seeing uh, single family construction costs are north of three hundred dollars a square foot, which wow. doesn't, you know, which doesn't, you know, you can't do affordability that way. It just doesn't no. work. The numbers don't no. work. And so that's, um, you know, so single family uh has basically ground to a halt uh and so adaptive reuse is, the, is really one of the most positive models both for multifamily and even for lower density what i'm i'm defining lower density as, as a quad or below and so uh that's what's probably going to happen within uh detroit proper for at least never, the next couple of years and i know abigail your work intersects with thinking about sustainability i mean uh you know one 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 um, uh, uh, kind of saying I hear frequently is the greenest building is the building that already exists. Any any thoughts on this, all from an environmental standpoint? Oh my goodness, I haven't heard that phrase before, but I, I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say NLC also just released a report talking about climate migration and what that means for yeah. the housing crisis. And so you think about um, we define like these three major characteristics of city, like three types of cities with that vulnerable cities, which is the ones of cities with low resources where people are gonna be moving out of those cities because of climate events, recipient cities, which are the ones where um, who will, cities where people will seek refuge from leaving vulnerable ones. So become like a host to a large number of people. Um, example being Houston from hurricanes in the Gulf Coast area, and then oh. climate destinations, which are cities that have been considered havens of having some affordable housing and relative safety from hurricanes or wildfires, like example of that being like a Buffalo, New York. So what we're seeing now, it's there will be some big transitions as climate change is causing more intensity and frequency of climate events. So um, this housing um, challenge is just going to be more intensified um, at a probably quick rate in the next 10 to 20 years. So from a climate perspective of thinking of increased severity and frequency of storms, Existing housing wasn't built with those things in mind. We know about flooding in areas that are happening, of um, wildfires that are being gro um, growing on the West Coast, the drought areas, so um, extreme heat. So our current housing is not built to withstand these types of severe events. So um, it may seem cheap right now, but when you think about the constant rebuild potential of new properties or um, adjustments of properties for those conditions. It's it's not going to be cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I want to raise a, a related point um, to the to the to the folks that asked this question. Um, another participant, Heather uh, Saylor, um, pointed out we're to the earlier conversation on parking, we're reassessing parking requirements, but much of it is citizen uh, perception of the lack of parking, um, not, not maybe reality, where the fact is about 5% of, of US land use is parking. And I know when you look at maps of a lot of cities, you just see how much uh, land is taken up by surface parking. So I think, you know, again, there's a, um, you know, it seems to be quite a bit of capacity out there to uh, to deliver uh, more ho housing. Hopefully, that's that's helpful. Um, I, I would like to move on, um, actually, back to Amy. Um, you know, what did it take to obtain public buy-in in support of your project? How? And I know you've talked extensively about this at this point, but I want you to maybe home in on, you know, the community conversation. Um, in, in, in the city, how did you come to the conclusion, the question um, questioner asks, to move forward targeting the residents to be served by your project? Did you go into this kind of saying, we're doing senior housing? Sounds like that was part of the thought process. Um, but what was that? How did that public buy-in 
Um, how did securing public buy-in work for you? Any advice for others, either on the public sector side or on the development side, sort of thinking about yep. this and working on similar challenges? Yeah. Well, before we identify a market, we usually get a market study to support our thoughts. And um, personally, I, it, it would be hard, it's hard to develop, to imagine a family living in, um, in a, within a mall, but I think a senior housing is a lot easier to, um, to kind of imagine. But that was just my thought. And we did, want, we did do a market analysis to see how many units we needed and would be supported and the population and also the incomes of the residents. That was identified in the market study too. Um, how we got community buy-in, we, um, I, I typically go and get stakeholders in the community and, um, and we work with them. And, and if we're finding that it's going sideways, we usually uh, suggest um, an advisory committee con con um, con um, con con uh, made up of the seniors and made up of the community itself so that we can design something that the community, that we're, makes us an asset to the community and not just go in there and say, we're, we're gonna do this. We, that is not how we wanted to do it. And then for Arundaquite, because they suffered so long, we, we set up, a, um, we asked for a contest. We had a contest for naming the project and it was a community event. And, um, and that tied the community and they gave reasons why. So they were thinking about why this project was important to the community and by thinking of a name and a history. And so it was really, um, we, we bring in the community as often as we can from the yeah. beginning. I hear that a lot. I hear bring in the community early, uh, get them involved in, in the ideation, build your champions, and, uh, you know, back to Antoine, I know you had referred to the community benefits uh, po program that you have in, in Detroit, and that's another best practice I hear about. Any, any thoughts on uh, the value of that? And obviously, it's not just to get approvals, but it's about, to, you know, uh, responsive community development. But any, any, any thoughts through that lens? Well, no, that's exactly it. It, it, it is something where we're, uh, one of the things that I, I promised when I came on board was that uh, we were going to um, develop a Detroit that's for Detroiters, right? And to do that, you have to uh, engage uh, with the residents often as possible in as many ways as possible, right? And that's something that most responsible developers would like to do and should be doing. Uh, and so I encourage all of us that are going to be very active in an adaptive reuse space uh, to be intentional to be a part of that community. You know, don't see it as purely or primarily a, a profit generating measure, but really look at it as an opportunity to deliver a needed amenity for that community. And to do so, you have to ensure that you hear uh, from that community um, as early as possible. Yeah, it seems to me that there's a, and I think you call them frequent flyers, you know, there's a very loud minority of folks who will stand up and, 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 and get worked up at city council meetings and say no to housing. Uh, but there's a huge population of people that not only are you know, maybe neutral to semi-positive, but but who who can really get excited if you engage them um, to to support uh, needed housing. So I think I think these two insights are really important and 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 really a great way to wrap up this conversation. I, I know we're right at two fifty five. I want to flag one final question that came in: um, an adaptive reuse credit for housing? Question mark. And uh, I'll just share with everyone in the audience um, and and David. Garcia alluded to this earlier. Um, Senator uh, Debbie Stabenow, um, Antoine Senator uh, of Michigan, um, has introduced uh, legislation called, uh, I believe, the Revitalizing Downtowns Act, uh, which is a 20% tax credit for eligible costs for the adaptive reuse of uh, commercial properties, uh, so long as 20% is affordable. Uh, so more to come. Uh, and in fact, I'll just share with everyone that uh, later this summer, up for Growth will publish a policy brief on this topic and on that bill. And so uh, we'll be happy to share this with uh, the NHC team uh, and, and get that out to anyone uh, logged on to today's webinar uh, who has interest in the topic. Um, so with that, uh, I believe I need to turn this back to David. Uh, David, thank you for the opportunity and I'll let you close it out. 
Thank you, Mike. And thanks to all of our panelists. Wow, was that great. Um, if we were in person, I would say, give everybody a big round of applause. So you can all do that in off camera. Um, I just want to um, say this series has been going so well and stay tuned for even more fascinating conversations. Want to alert people that June 14th, it's right around the corner. This is going to be our first gala in almost three years. So um, we're going to be having it at the Anthem. We're expecting 500 people and um, we're gonna have a dance floor. So um, you don't wanna miss it. Um, please be sure to uh, check out our website and get your tickets. If you're not a member, you can join at nhc.org. And we look forward to seeing you all soon, um, more and more in person.